welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Yonggyuk Kim. North Korea held a military parade marking the 90th anniversary of the country's army. Their leader Kim Jong-un vowed to use nuclear weapon if the regime is threatened and also to advance its nuclear capabilities as fast as possible. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden is set to visit Seoul next month to meet South Korea's incoming President Yoon suk yeol with North Korea's recent provocations expected to be at the top of the agenda. Today, we'll discuss these and more. That the DPRK constitutes a threat to international peace and security and to the global non proliferation regime. In the studio with me is Bruce Klingner, Senior Research Fellow for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Center. Mr. Klingner served as CIA's Deputy Division Chief for Korea. Also joining me is Toby Dalton, Co-Director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment. Dr. Dalton previously held senior positions at the Energy Department, including Acting Director for the Office of Nuclear Safeguards and Security. Welcome to the show. Really good to have you both in the studio. Thank you. Nice to be here. First of all, uh, we'll talk about what Kim Jong-un said at the parade. Kim Jong-un said the fundamental mission of our nuclear forces is deter war, but the nukes can never be confined to the single mission of war deterrent, even at a time when the situation they're not desirous of. And then he continued on saying, if any forces try to violate the fundamental interests of their country, the nuclear forces will have to accomplish its second mission. Um, Mr. Klinger, what was your overall thought when you heard this? I, I think it's very consistent with what North Korea has been saying for quite some time. Uh, some interpreted the, the speech as indicating a shift in North Korean nuclear doctrine, uh, that now it added uh, attacks on incoming forces or preemption as a, as a new component. I, North Korea has been talking about preemption since at least 2013. So I think it was largely consistent, but perhaps more forthcoming or, or forward leaning in depicting the, the different parts of the nuclear doctrine. So it's deterrence, it's attacking forces, uh, and then also preemptive attacks if they perceive that the US or South Korea is about to attack them. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Dalton, what Kim Jong-un said was not really shocking or surprising? Uh, not to me, no. Mm -hmm. I think, as, as Bruce suggested, and I agree, there's a continuity with the way that North Korean leaders have been talking about nuclear weapons for, for some time. Uh, what was notable to me about the statement was the use of the term fundamental. Uh, and it actually mirrored, I think, quite closely the recent U.S. nuclear posture review statement, which says that the fundamental role for the United States of nuclear weapons is to deter a nuclear attack. Uh, and so I think that there's actually a little bit of mirror imaging here, uh, partly so that uh, Kim Jong-un can put forward this idea that North Korea, like the United States, is a responsible holder uh, and, and possessor of, of nuclear weapons. Actually, I was going to ask you about the, you, the word um, uh, fundamental. Why do you think, so was he sort of imitating what the United States was doing? I think so. Just, oh. I'm sure there's other reasons for him to formulate the statement in that way. Mm -hmm. but. First and foremost, to reiterate that the fundamental purpose of nuclear weapons is this to deter war. That's, that's the reason that they have them. Uh, but like the United States, I think also to show that nuclear weapons can be used for other things too, beyond specific uh, just deterring war. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kleiner, what are the fundamental interests for North, East, North Korea? Well, for them, nuclear weapons serves an, a number of purposes. So, so military and domestic, as well as messaging to the outside world. So. Uh, as they said in their 2013 nuclear law, 
uh, the, the fundamental role is to deter, but they also make very clear that they will attack with nuclear weapons any uh, invading force. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also don't distinguish between military and civilian targets, and they don't distinguish between the United States and its allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then these preemptive comments that they made over the years have been, uh, they will preempt our preemption. Mm -hmm. uh, they will attack if they perceive even the slightest hint uh, of an impending attack by the U.S. Uh, or South Korea. So, you know, with everyone vowing to preempt the other, uh, it, it causes that concern that we may stumble into a nuclear war. People may misperceive routine military exercises or statements as indicating some new, more provocative action. And so, uh, you know, in a way, we're always on the knife edge of a crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Klinger, you're saying that this isn't the first time that Kim Jong-un suggested that North Korea can use a nuclear weapon for preemptive strike, is that right? Not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the earliest comments I've, I've found is 2013, but there may be before. And actually, even before they admitted that they had nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. uh, in 1994, they told the U.S., you know, after looking at, uh, you know, the Iraq war and, and other actions, that we won't wait for you to attack us. We will attack you first. Mm -hmm. and, and that was before they admitted that they had nuclear weapons, even though at the time the U.S. assessed that they had at least fissile material for nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dalton, this, what Kim Jong-un said in combination with what Kim Yo-jong said earlier mm -hmm. about nuclear weapon. Uh, so in South Korea, they're considering, a lot of people are considering this as a threat of a preemptive strike. How seriously should we take this? I think we should take it as seriously as we have been taking the North Korean nuclear problem for quite some time. It's clear that North Korea is on this trajectory of building out this nuclear capability. Uh, we're starting to see subtle shifts in, in capability uh, with the development of so-called tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, you have now the, the doctrine statements that are starting to emphasize preemption a little bit more. Uh, and so I think we need to begin to adjust uh, the deterrence posture and how we think about that threat uh, going forward, both uh, for the United States, but obviously in the context of the alliance too. Uh, and for me, the really important thing here is that if North Korea is thinking more about preemption, mm -hmm. we need to be more careful then in thinking about counter provocation actions. Uh, and so not finding ourselves in a situation where inadvertently uh, you have an escalation uh, because North Korea interpreted something differently than we intended it to. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that even United States and South Korea should be more careful about preemptive strike? I, I, I'm sure it's something that the U.S. forces Korea and, mm -hmm. and colleagues there have been concerned about for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the South Korean army has been very aware of, of uh, the potential for provocations and, and potential preemption. So it's... I think well factored into the planning, mm -hmm. uh, but now that the preempt, the, the double preemption, if you will, uh, that creates situations where escalation could happen very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think there just needs to be more care and thought into projecting how actions and reactions might escalate. Yeah, I mean, I found your response very interesting because in Korea, the incoming President Yoon Song Yeol, he mentioned about uh, preemptive strike might be needed mm -hmm. when during his campaign. So there was a lot of debate in South Korea. So what was your thought? It's totally understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a threat. It's a threat that's growing. Mm -hmm. South Korea has to live right next to this, uh, this threatening posture from North Korea. Uh, and so I think the emotional aspect of that is something that he's responding to. Mm -hmm. And it's natural to want to increase your own defenses. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what he's doing. It's also good domestic politics, mm -hmm. too, you know, to project strength and to say, you know, we're going to uh, improve our own capabilities to deter North Korea from attempting this. But it does have this downside, which is that you see this kind of action-reaction spiral happening. And that doesn't appear to have entered into his public comments yet, mm -hmm. uh, the awareness that uh, there are dangers to going down this road if you don't also look for off-ramps uh, to create more stability mm -hmm. with North Korea. Mr. Kleiner, you earlier mentioned preempting preemptive mm -hmm. strike. Is that even possible? Well, it, it, it depends on, you know, very good intelligence mm -hmm. that uh, you have detected missile capabilities, nuclear capabilities that are in a, in a position to launch quickly. Uh, you discern or you assess that the leadership, capa uh, leadership intentions are to attack. 
that if missiles are out in the field, that they are nuclear tipped and that they are out there about to be launched in an, atta an attack mode as opposed to military exercising or, or a messaging. So an intelligence analyst can go down to the Oval Office and say, we think they are about to attack. We think those missiles are nuclear tipped. We think they are not in a military exercise. Over to you, Mr. President. And then the president has the decision of, does he launch based on the best estimate or guess that the intelligence community has? It's very difficult. So usually the, the US has always had a preemptive option, but we tend to think more of retaliatory, perhaps even after launch while the missiles are still in midair, and we hope our missile defenses can, can intercept anything that's, that's launched. Um, but it was sort of surprising why uh, President-elect Yun's comments about preemption were were you know, so surprising to people. Under Presidents Lee myung Bak and Park Geun-hye and Moon Jae-in, North or South Korea has had a preemptive option. Mm -hmm. uh, they called it their 3K uh, kill chain, Korea air and missile defense, and Korea massive pub and punishment response. Um, so it's been South Korean declared policy for 15 years or so. And President-elect Yoon really was just reiterating what standing South Korean policy was. Uh, Moon Jae-in didn't talk about it as much. He actually changed the wording uh, away from retaliation and massive punishment and gave it a more benign terminology. But it still was South Korea's official declaratory policy. Mm -hmm. If we go back to the parade and what Kim Jong-un said, um, so well, when we think about what Kim Jong-un said overall, is this in line with the five-year plan announced in January last year, uh, Mr. Klinger first? Well, what we've seen in the last several years, mm -hmm. uh, certainly 2017 with uh, ICBM launches, nuclear tests, and then in 2019 and beyond, a really you know, large number of missiles, a record level of missiles launched in a year and in a month, et cetera, um, where they've revealed at least a dozen new weapon systems, uh, mostly short and medium range, and then they've paraded others. Um, and they've had a successful IBM launch, uh, IC launches in 2017 and again this year. So the capabilities are growing. And North Korean nuclear doctrine has both driven capabilities and then evolved once those capabilities uh, have been achieved. So clearly they have the intention and the capabilities to hit the mainland United States with nuclear weapons, uh, U.S. bases in the Pacific, and then Japan and South Korea. And indeed in 2016 and 2017, they announced that they were doing military missile exercises that were simulating nuclear air bursts on South Korean uh, and Japanese targets. So Kim Yo-jong and others have said, oh, we won't attack South Korea. Well, they've, they've announced that they, they would, and they have been announcing that and practicing that for a decade or so. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dalton, uh, is North Korea steadily going ahead with its five-year plan? As far as I can tell, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had the announcement in January of 2021 about the desire for tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, now we see a delivery system that is uh, touted as being for tactical nuclear weapons. We have more discussion of preemption, which kind of fits better with that capability. Uh, I think what's left to see, uh, and, and people have speculated that this is coming, is another nuclear explosive test that would be a smaller device that could fit on a short range weapon. Um, and then the big question for me that we haven't seen at least public indicators of yet is where does the fissile material come from uh, for all of these new weapons and, and capabilities? Uh, you have to expect that uh, if they're going to be building many more tactical nuclear weapons, uh, long range systems, et cetera, uh, then there has to be more fissile material that's coming uh, uh, to feed those. And it's probably not going to just be from the young gun complex, it has to be from elsewhere too. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me, consistent with Kim Jong-un's remarks, not just for quality, but also quantity uh, of weapons uh, increasing, that we see uh, more fissile material production uh, in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, during the parade, North Korea, as far as I, we can tell, proudly um, show their weapons, various weapons that can be used for a nuclear strike. And the photo of Hwasong-17 especially garnered a lot of interest. Um, earlier, Hwasong-17, the, they claimed to have tested Hwasong-17, but then South Korean military assessed it was in fact Hwasong-15. So what did you think about when Hwasong-17 um, showed up in parade? Is it related to what everybody else is thinking about it? Or is it just a 
they're, I mean, they were going to show it anyways. Yeah, I think they're, they're attempting to project an image of confidence, of a variety of capability that can deter not just the United States, but also South Korea. Uh, the Hwasong-17 is an important capability as they evolve uh, to be able to hold at risk many more targets in the United States uh, by the ability to put multiple warheads on that missile. I would expect that they would have been uh, hoping the first test launch that was assessed to have failed would have worked. The very nice video of Kim Jong-un and the leather jacket uh, and the sunglasses uh, coming out in front of that missile, I think was a good indicator of how invested they are uh, in that capability. So it didn't surprise me to see it in, in the parade. Uh, and it also wouldn't surprise me to see them try to fly test it again before too long. Mm -hmm. Um, Mr. Kleiner, what did you think about overall the parade, Hwasong-17, and the failed, apparently failed test? Well, one adage that's sort of been common when looking at North Korea is that North Korea missiles always fail. Well, until they don't. Um, so in the past, they would have a lot more failures, as the U.S. had a lot of failures early on in our space program and missile programs in the early 1960s. Uh, Lately, their missiles have been doing very well. I mean, the, the Hwasong-17 test seemed to be the first major failure in, I think, since 2017. Um, and what's different under Kim Jong-un is that uh, when there's a failure, he doesn't purge all the scientists, and he sort of sees it as, well, this is a, a price of learning. And they will have a, a new launch sometime shortly after a failed one. They did six uh, Hwasong-12 IRBM launches in 2017. Uh, three of them failed, and then they quickly did three more that were successful. So uh, I would think Kim wants to get the Hwasong-17 right. Uh, so I, I would expect another 17 launch. When we see from a little bit bigger picture what Kim Jong-un said at the parade and what they showed at the parade, um, what does that mean for the inter-Korean relationship? And what does that mean for U.S.-North Korea relationship? We've had eight international agreements on denuclearization. They've all failed. That doesn't mean we don't try for a ninth. Uh, but hopefully we learn some lessons from the past. But, um, you know, there's debate amongst Korea watchers as to how to approach North Korea. Uh, do we offer concessions just to get them uh, into the same room as, as we are? I, I disagree with that idea. Um, you know, we, we try for diplomacy. It's certainly North Korea that's been hesitant to have talks, let alone negotiations. Uh, but while we try to maintain diplomatic openings or, or uh, outreaches, you know, we have to maintain the deterrence uh, to defend ourselves and our allies. And, and there are a number of things to do there. Uh, and then also we need to enforce our own laws and international uh, UN sanctions uh, in order to maintain the, you know, the viability of those resolutions and U.S. laws. And then there are other lanes in the road of information operations, overt and covert and uh, other means. But you need to have a, a comprehensive, integrated strategy using all the instruments of national power. And, and too often the debate, not only in Washington, but Seoul and elsewhere, has been, should we do diplomacy or sanctions? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you need both along with other tools. Mm -hmm. It's important to to take a step back and, and realize that uh, at some point our objectives have to change. For quite a long time now, uh, we've been discussing denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. That's not happening. North Korea is going to continue to possess nuclear weapons. And I think for me, it's more important to begin to think about how do we reduce the risks of a nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula. And that suggests a different track of diplomacy than the one that we've been trying. Still strengthen deterrence, still focus on resiliency and jointness in the uh, ROK-US alliance. Uh, but also think about ways to engage North Korea uh, in, on terms that would allow for a reduction in the kinds of tensions that could escalate to war. What we hear from State Department or Defense Department is really not that different from what we heard in the past. So even it seems like it is, are they downplaying the situation? I'm not sure what else we should do or what the U.S. government should do. Uh, right now. Continuing to enforce the sanctions, that's, that's fine. There's not going to be more sanctions because China and Russia won't agree to more sanctions. Uh, the effectiveness of sanctions, I think, hasn't really been demonstrated. Um, in fact, probably the harshest conditions that North Korea has uh, uh, had over the last uh, decades are these last two years that have been self-imposed, not because of international sanctions. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like until the U.S. and South Korean governments reorient their policies in more fundamental ways, 
we're kind of in a, a status quo situation and there's not very much stronger statements, stronger reactions, not going to change things uh, in any appreciable way. Mm -hmm. Our responses are dependent on North Korean actions in many cases. So there's a hierarchy of international responses. We respond the most strongly to nuclear tests and then ICBM tests, and then below that it tends to be less of a reaction. Um, there are things we can be doing to enfor enforce our own laws more, more firmly, not only against North Korean entities, but Chinese. You know, we, we've uh, imposed $9 billion in fines on uh, European banks for money laundering for Iran. We've imposed zero dollars in fines on Chinese banks. Uh, the Trump White House took no action against a list of 12 Chinese banks committing money laundering crimes in the U.S. that Congress sent in 2017. So there are more things. But, uh, you know, there are different approaches or different variations of denuclearization, arms control, threat reduction, crisis reduction, confidence and security building measures. All of those are good, and we should all pr pursue them, not only on nuclear, but on conventional weapons. The common factor, though, is you need someone on the other side willing to actually sit down and talk with you. And North Korea is refusing to have any kind of dialogue. So the ball is in their court. Um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't get them to negotiate. So uh, in the meantime, we do try to maintain the, the shield of deterrence and enforcing our own laws and, and hoping through other actions to change the, the North Korean calculations. Mm -hmm. Then my last question for today. Mr. Kloner, what do you expect to see out of the summit that's going to happen in May between President Biden and incoming President Yoon? Well, a cynical view is we're going to see more of the same. But I think, you know, in a more positive sense is we're going to have the U.S. and South Korea much more in alignment, not only on alliance issues, uh, but on North Korean, Chinese and Japanese policies. So uh, both sides have removed some of the irritants or the points of friction. Uh, the U.S. is no longer insulting our allies. We're no longer demanding payment and threatening to remove our forces if we aren't paid enough. Uh, the U.N. administration won't go after what I see as a premature uh, operational control transition or a declaration of war. So there's going to be a, a much greater uh, similarity of views. That doesn't mean that North Korea and China will be solved, uh, but at least we'll be heading in the same direction without kind of the facade that, oh, yes, we're not disagreeing when in fact we were. Mm. And Dr. Dalton? I think there's a real opportunity with the summit to get back on the same page, uh, if you will. Um, not that the U.S. and South Korean governments were really off the, the same page uh, to the extent in the, in the Moon administration, uh, but there's a lot of concern voiced in South Korea these days about the Ukraine, uh, the Russian attack on Ukraine, and whether North Korea might be inspired to do something similar. Uh, many South Koreans have expressed interest in having their own nuclear weapons. So I think the, the Biden administration has an opportunity here to really demonstrate the U.S. commitment uh, in very visible and, and uh, you know, hopefully emotive ways that uh, reassure South Koreans that uh, the alliance is, is very strong uh, and that we'll work together to, to deter the, the North Korean attacks. We can hope that that's, that's really uh, what comes out of this. It will look and feel probably like things that have been done in the past, but I think this moment is also very important to, to make sure that from the beginning of the UN administration, we're on the right foot uh, walking to, forward together. I would just add, I, I think the US and South Korea were on the same page during the Moon administration, but the paragraphs were in a different order. Now I think we're not only on the same page, but the paragraphs will be in the same order. Mm -hmm. President Biden will visit South Korea and Japan as he's working to build a united front in the Indo-Pacific region amid the intensifying rivalry between the U.S. and China. However, much attention will be also paid whether he'll be able to come up with some tangible outcome about what to do with North Korea's continuing nuclear ambition. Mr. Klinger and Dr. Dalton, thank you so much for being with us today. It's so good to see you in person. Well, thank you for having us. Great to be here. And that does it for this week's Washington Talk from Voice of America. Please join us again next week for more analysis.